My name is Nick Bolton and I'd like to welcome you to the first webinar in our new Medical Device Tracking Symposium series. We'll be covering many topics including changing government regulations, industry guidance, infrastructure and technology challenges facing us all. We will be releasing white papers, webinars and blogs and there'll be a conference on this topic sometime in 2016. In addition, we'll be hosting a forum for questions and answers from industry experts to interact within our community. And as a point of admin today, this is a listen-only webinar, but we will provide questions and answers section at the end. We've assembled a great collection of panelists, all with deep domain knowledge in systems engineering, and our guest panelist brings many years' experience in regulatory compliance covering both medical devices, biotech, and pharmaceuticals, and has served as a consultant for the FDA during the development of the original 21 CFR Part 11 specification project. To jump right in, this is what we will be covering during the session. The recent packaging and labeling rule related to unique device identifiers known as the 2013 Final Rule UDIs. Its meaning and implications, what we have to do and when, what is the rule and what is not the rule, anything coming down in the future we need to know about, what can Portford do to help us with these requirements? What is the biggest challenge facing the medical device industry? According to the most respected industry trends publishing group, Emergo, in the past few years of reporting on the annual state of the industry for medical devices, they found that the biggest challenge faced by the consensus of the industry experts is the changing regulatory environment. Joe is now going to help us explore these implications. Thanks, Nick. I'm Joe Bonomo. I've been working with the FDA regulatory compliances related to systems for about the past 25 years. This is the section of the webinar that deals with what the current regulations are and why they were created. I'll be presenting this section as a series of questions with their corresponding answers. So, the September 2013 FDA final rule on UDIs for medical devices is now the law. So what does this mean for the medical device industry? It means that imminently medical device manufacturers will have to upgrade their labeling and packaging systems along with their data management capabilities in order to stay compliant with incoming regulations. This is independent of creating systems to meet the demands of electronic regulatory reporting to the FDA and EMEHA and the agencies. Why was this law put on the books? Whole, there was little concentrated information on the state of devices provided to the patient population by the industry. Simple marketing data such as what a company makes, what kind of device it is, the sales figure for each individual implant per medical device, or the number of procedures done for each implant each year are readily available. But key safety and efficacy information is not readily available to companies, regulatory agencies, and the communities they serve. So industry watchdogs were concerned that little information is gathered in any one place about the potential dangers and flaws of these devices or the complications that can occur due to the implantation procedure. So revised infra regulations were forthcoming. Uh, they'd be implemented over time. So Bruce is presenting some of what is to come later in this session. As evident in the following chart, you can see that the number of medical devices recalled from the market nearly doubled in the past decade through 2012. So recall accounts for the fiscal year and their potential risks to the public are presented herein. The following is a quote from a recently published report and has been determined that the 510K programming is in need of modification to support both in safety and efficacy concerns. An alarming number of new medical devices gained FDA approval through a system known as the 510K program. The FDA typically evaluates new products with stringent pre-market testing through the PMA program. This process can be bypassed if a manufacturer can demonstrate that its product is substantially equivalent to one already on the market. Under the current 510K program, a new medical device can be marketed and implanted in patients without any clinical testing or reviews of outcomes. While the 510K process provides patients with quick access to innovations in medicine, there is an unsettling consequence. The FDA has cleared a flood of new devices without requiring manufacturers to prove their safety and effectiveness. From 2005 to 2009, 71% of Class III highest risk medical devices cleared through a 510K program were later recalled over safety concerns. 
criticizing the potential risk of 510K cleared devices, the Government Accountability Office has urged the FDA to improve the process for medical device review. A collections of actions were suggested, and the FDA plans to fully comply starting in 2013 with full compliance by 2020. What this is that there to be more of the changing regulatory environments that Nick spoke of earlier. Um, it's been a burdensome on the industry, and it's most likely in the form of a, a 510K process revisions uh, with the requirements for the collection of more clinical information pre and post submission. So what exactly is the law? There's been a great deal of confusion about what will be imposed by the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. It's also known as Obamacare. That was passed in 2010. Think of the law as having many distinct parts. From the title alone, you have the core components of patient protection, part of the law governing such things as increasing quality and access to information, and affordable care addressing health care coverage and the cost. One key component affecting the medical device industry is the requirement to uniquely identify every device implanted in a patient. The unique identification UDI system is intended to assign a unique identifier to medical devices within the United States. It was signed into law on September 27, 2007 as part of the Food Administration Amendments Act of 2007. This act includes language related to the establishment of a unique device identification system, and that is what is the law. Covering both labeling and the global UDI database, manufacturers need to assess their current technical capabilities for both hardware and software, and work how much they need to do in order to comply. Within the European market, the European Commission also announced their intention to follow suit, potentially as, as early as this year. Compliance is to begin for some companies at the end of 2014, and all companies to be fully compliant for 2020. It's expected that many Class 1 devices are to be exempt, but most Class 2 and Class 3 devices will be included to, as a requirement to have these UDIs um, maintained. This comes the reality of, what do I actually have to do? The label of a device is to bear the unique identifier unless an alternative location is specified by the U.S. FDA, or unless an exception is made for a particular device or group of devices. For one, the unique identifier is to be able to identify the device through distribution and use. And secondly, the unique identifier is to include the lot number or serial number if specified by the FDA. By the FDA adoption of the UDI system, we expected that the central requirement will create a common vocabulary of reporting in, of enhanced electronic capabilities. Currently, analysis of adverse event reports is limited by the fact that the specific devices involved in an incident are often not known with a required degree of specificity. Without a common vocabulary for medical devices, meaningful analysis based on data from existing voluntary systems is problematic. Reliable and consistent identification of medical devices would enable safety surveillance that the FDA and manufacturers could better identify potential problems of devices and defects and improve patient care. In a medical sense, device refers to a product that is not pharmaceutical in nature. While the FDA has been given approval to exempt some devices, the FDA's VP of the UDI program, Jay Crawley, the person that was actually responsible for implementing the UDI requirements in the Act, has an express an intent to apply the UDI to, quote, everything until someone gives us a good reason not to do it, end quote. So when do you have to act to meet compliance to the law? Well, since passing the Act, uh, there have been calls for the FDA to publish a timeline for the implementation of the UDI, and that published timeline for the FDA is presented in the table below. So we address what the law is, but the next question is, what isn't the law? Well, what was in the specification of the original Affordable Care Act was the creation of the National Medical Device Registry, also known as the NMDR, but that was later dropped during negotiations as being true intuitive at the time uh, to be imposed upon the medtech industry, including biotech, pharma, and medical device industries, and it was dropped due to industry press related to adherence to the initial law. It was expected to be included in one of the next revisions of the Affordable Care Act. The task force for the continuing investigation already exists and they are working on proposals acceptable to industry, academia, and regulatory professionals. Uh, the following is a direct quote about what the NMDR is. Initially, as proposed in the Affordable Care Act, a national medical device registry was to be established by the Department of Health and Human Services. 
Within the registry, devices would be listed by type, model and serial number, and a unique identifier. The registry was intended to assist HHS in evaluating the safety and effectiveness of all implanted medical devices. It would link data provided by manufacturers to the FDA with clinical outcomes data drawn from many sources, including Medicare claims data, electronic medical records, and adverse event reports. The registry data and analyses would be stripped of patient information and ultimately made available to the public and to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The NMDR would also authorize HHS to require device makers to submit information necessary to aid post-market assessments of device safety and effectiveness and provide notification of device risk on an annual basis. So anyway, while the registry was not ultimately included in the final version of the bill, its proposed creation is an indicator of the potential future government role and direction for tracking medical devices. It is expected that device companies will be inclined to adhere to best practice anyway and embrace many elements of the proposed registry concept for their own use. The industry has adopted the standard for device identification that was originally proposed of its own volition. What all this boils down to is compliance to the new regulations current current stages through 2020 to allow our industry to come into full compliance. Even with a published framework for UDI regulation compliance, there are still other regulation and guidance in the works we have to be vigilant for. Uh, Bruce is going to be talking later about some of the particulars of what's upcoming, and uh, that'll be very informative. All right, next off to Bruce. Thank you. So what else is coming? International Medical Device Regulators Forum convened a Global Harmonization Task Force in 2011 that produced a new guidance document titled Unique Device Identification System for Medical Devices, released September 16, 2011. This is a guidance document for the industry without the weight of being a government regulation. It addresses a globally harmonized and consistent approach to UDI management. The goal is to aid in the collection of information leading to increased patient safety and to help optimize patient care by facilitating the following. Traceability of devices, especially for recalls and other field service corrective actions. Adequate identification of device through its distribution and use. Identification of devices in adverse events. Reduction of medical errors. Documentation and longitudinal capture of data on medical devices. In support of this clinical data collection, it is expected that medical device trials will increasingly adopt many of the clinical trial design features and performance characteristics that have been employed in trials managed by pharmaceutical companies for decades. Hierarchy of clinical data, from controlled randomized trials to single arm studies compared to published literature data. Statistical data to support FDA submissions that prove clinical effectiveness via statistical significance of the endpoints based on priori hypotheses. The importance of intended use, statements made in the labeling regarding how the product is intended to be used by the healthcare professional. De novo process, sponsors de novo applications providing information to demonstrate that the product presents only a low to moderate risk to public health, even though the application does not meet all the requirements of a 510K. Leveraging other sources of data, Companies can leverage clinical experience from outside the United States in lieu of a pilot study. All of the above discussion about what is to come leads to best practice. What should I do to help anticipate and meet or exceed the changing regulatory environment? Now I'm going to hand back to Nick, who's going to take you through the workflow process. MedDevTrack takes a proven approach to the logistics of managing devices along with expert regulatory input and future enhancements such as predictive analysis and adverse event management. Let's talk about the current approach to managing device disposition. The event-driven workflow allows multiple devices to be tracked per event. A typical process would include device shipment, which could be an output from an ERP system, Receipt by the sales team or hospital, which may be via the web or still in paper form. Use in the patient, which is implanting of the devices and gathering of the physician and patient information. Escalation, this is used to help manage an explant of a device in a possible adverse event. And, of course, patient registration, which may also be via the web and helps maintain contact with the patient for possible recall. 
Throughout each event, every part of the process is captured in an audit trail. This includes every disposition change and a range of other activities, such as field inventory checks, utilizing device barcode technology, or automated correspondence creation, ranging from something as simple as a physician follow-up to a device audit. Ingestion of documents from email, fax, data capture from customer portals is all integrated currently into the product. Also, maintenance of the most current contact details for patient and physician is very important, along with quality control, including electronic signatures and, of course, standard FDA reporting. Let's talk about what other problems will be solved by technology, and Bruce will present the current MedDevTrack roadmap. We have both a vision and a roadmap that builds on our current device tracking platform to produce a complete end-to-end -end regulatory solution for medical device companies. We designed our system with an expansive specification that provides all the features and services needed to meet both best practice and all regulatory requirements. Government system integration. We will be integrating to different government systems and technologies as they are released, such as the GUI ID web services platform and the FDA PMA reporting portal. Cloud-based solution. To complement our current on-premise offering, we are building a highly secure and scalable cloud-based solution. This will make it easy for your team to manage new and existing products with accessibility for reps in the field. Imaging integration. Integration of an industry-proven imaging repository for analysis and reporting. The image, imaging system will support pre-surgery diagnostic images, initial implant and all subsequent follow-up meeting with radiological and photographic standard and PACS compliance. Predictive analysis. Predictive analysis uses big data models of time series data to support early decisions about device behavior. The analytics engine takes the data from the entire life of the products as they are being tracked. In closing, we are committed to providing best-in-class solutions, meeting all of your requirements, and you can count on us to stay abreast of all of the current and future regulatory changes. Now I'm going to hand back to Joe, who will be talking about meeting compliance needs. Thanks, Bruce. So, how can we at MedDevTrack help you with your compliance needs and beyonds? Well, first off, we have extensive experience with clinical data collection uh, with regards to meeting 21 CFR Part 11 compliance and full GCP regulation understanding. We also know about the CDISC standards and the uh, dom device domains uh, that are proposed and are in action now. We also know about how to make submissions for uh, medical device reporting in terms of the EMDR portals, plus uh, basic PMI and 510K registration packages. Uh, another area that we have a strong expertise in is advanced data reporting in terms of graphical representation of data from things as simple as demographics, but also beyond that, uh, that can be used for decision making. And one area that we're concentrating on heavily is we have a good statistical background in predictive analytics, which is how we can measure a device's behavior over time and use it to uh, make decisions about uh, trends in data uh, related to going beyond device tolerances and um, uh, gives you an understanding of where, where your device is in terms of uh, the data that's been collected over time. In order to meet all the above requirements, we have a staff of experts and services that we can offer beyond just device medical device tracking software. We can deal with expert configuration to provide the best implementation of our systems to meet the requirements of your devices. We can deal with device trial definitions, management and reporting. And we have a group that's related to regulatory preparedness consulting, quality assurance environment setup, mock audits, and regulatory gap analysis reports. Thank you for attending our first webinar, and if you'd like to remain on the WebEx and send us any questions via the chat, we'll be happy to answer them. Otherwise, thank you again, and we'll see you for the next presentation in the series where our focus will be technology.